Hey, welcome to Speechless this fine Thursday. We're coming live from the SEC studios in White Bear Lake. We're glad to have you. And again, we got video that you will get no place else but here. I was at a conference today on Minnesota Religious Freedom Forum. And guess who the only press was that was videotaping? Yeah, it was me. Uh, so I got some interesting things. Uh, just going to show one video from there. But Hobby Lobby, the attorneys for Hobby Lobby were there. And they, uh, it was unbelievable. It was fantastic what they had to say. Um, and next week, I'll show you um, some information that was given first time from Hobby Lobby. First time one of the attorneys ever said this information uh, about their discussions on their religious freedoms as a corporation. And of course, Hobby Lobby is uh, suing the federal government and the federal government suing Hobby Lobby because they are not going uh, along with the uh, Obamacare and uh, being forced against their religious beliefs as a corporation to fund activities that go against their religious belief. So it was a fascinating conference. Uh, big name attorneys that practiced before the U.S. Supreme Court were there, and it's just fascinating. We're going to hear from one of them uh, in a little bit uh, discussing religious freedoms. But a fantastic uh, uh, event, and you know, there's about 400 uh, people that attended, pastors, uh, lawyers uh, from around the state, and probably from some other states close by. But I want to give you an update also on Ray. Now, we've been talking about Ray Woodstrand, a young man who works at the studio who got beat up on Eastside St. Paul. Uh, there was a fundraiser for him uh, last couple weeks ago, and that fundraiser raised $14,000 uh, for his medical bills and for his care. And he came, and it was uh, unbelievable. Um, let's, let's put it this way. He's got a long, long way to go. And, uh, you know, of course, he still hasn't had his uh, skull cap put back on. Uh, but he was there at the event, and he had a, a helmet on to protect him, and he was in a wheelchair. Uh, but he could rec he recognized people, he recognized me, said my name. You know, he's got uh, slur a little slurred speech. Uh, the right hand, right side is, you know, it's gaining strength. But he did not move that very much while I was there. The left side. Uh, he was working with, but he just got into the swimming pool it's down at Courage Center, and uh, that was a, a good thing because he was able to do things he couldn't do uh, without the water. And he's walking now, Phil. And, and he is walking now. Uh, before he couldn't walk, and now, now he's walking. So he's making great strides, but boy, he's got a long way to go, a long, long way to go. And one of the young men, and I call him men, uh, I believe it was a 15-year-old, uh, was just sentenced to two years uh, as a juvenile uh, for participating in the uh, beating and, and stomping on his head. Um, two other people are going to be tried as adults. They may certify another one as an adult, but uh, one of the cases is uh, settled already, and that individual is giving testimony as to what took place. So evidently that's going to be the best deal out there. Uh, but all these, all these men are still entitled to a defense um, because you're dealing with eyewitnesses. I don't know what evidence they do have of who did what to Ray, uh, but they're entitled to a defense because somebody may be lying about it. So we don't know. Uh, I don't know yet, but those are coming up. Um, so anyway, the good news, $14,000 uh, raised for Ray Woodstrand. You can still donate to Ray Woodstrand's uh, fund. It's called Ray's Fund, and it's in uh, go to Wells Fargo and just call them up and say, I want to donate to Ray's Fund, and Wells Fargo will know uh, what to do. All right, we got a call coming in. So uh, caller, uh, you have a comment or question? Well, I have a comment. Okay. You know, it's kind of sad. When you kill someone, they'll put you away for life. 
But if if you mentally decapacitate someone like the they did with a savage beating, what does this young man get? Two years, he's going to be 17 and out in the street again? They should be putting him away for 30 years at a minimum for taking someone's mental capacity. That's just as bad or worse than killing someone. They're leaving him a vegetable. I mean... Well, I, I mean, there are definitely issues there, and, and if this was the person that did the beating uh, and caused the injuries, yeah, that, this, this is ridiculous. Uh, my understanding, this isn't the person, but he participated in the activities and encouragement and in a gang-style type thing. So I really don't know the details, uh, and that has to be found out, and evidently the county prosecutor, the judge, and the defense attorney and the client all agreed that this would, uh, would be the situation. So, I mean, there's a number of people to hold accountable in this situation, and we, we, I need further information to decide, you know, it, it, was this good enough? Because he may have just kicked Ray in the leg. You know, that, that's all he may have done. But he well, there's supposed to be some more severe penalties for gang involvement in... I think we should, you know, that should be pursued. I realize they're using him as a witness to help hold these other people accountable, and that's very important. But, I, I mean, it's still, this type of behavior is still a travesty. Right. Well, a exactly. It definitely is. No doubt about it. All right. Okay. Thank you, caller. Thank you. All right. Now, um, I want to get on to uh, something that came up this week. Uh, well, last Tuesday at the Maplewood um, council chambers there was a uh, Minnesota women's voters uh, group I forget what they're called uh, they had their forum for the Maplewood elections of course it's a forum so what I don't like about forums is somebody can just lie through their teeth and not be held accountable by the other members that are there running for office and of course uh, a former mayor, Diana Longry, was running uh, for mayor again. She was there, of course. I'm all in behind Diana Longry. And uh, Rebecca Cave couldn't make it, and Margaret Behrens couldn't make it. The other two candidates I'm behind. But the three candidates, incumbent Kathy Juneman, uh, former state rep Nora Slawick, and then uh, Mary Lee Abrams, uh, uh, they were there. And... They're running as a group, and they're replacing the old Rossbach, uh, the angry man, uh, abusive man. Uh, they're replacing his group of people. Of course, Kathy Juneman, who also has anger management issues, uh, you know, has no problem uh, giving the bird to citizens in council chambers. But just a couple things, a couple comments about that event, and we'll move on. One. There was a citizen in the room, in the city council chambers, who was holding up a picture which had Kathleen Juneman flipping off one of the citizens in that very same room. And the city manager, Chuck All, came over to him and said, you can't hold that sign up after the event was over. That's campaign material. And you can't campaign in city chambers. And now that's a rule. It's not a law, there's no penalty or whatever, like anything like that. But he took down uh, the most famous man in Maplewood, uh, took down his name and number, and said, you can't do that. In the meantime, you have four candidates sitting in there asking everybody to vote for him. And, of course, it wasn't campaign material. It was just uh, material showing that... Uh, this city council member has a problem and has an anger management problem and how that city council member treats their own citizen. So that was interesting. But a, a couple of campaign pieces came out by Ask Me. Uh, I, I believe it was by Ask Me. Um, and one of them was talking about how during Diana Longry's term, the accounting system was so bad that... Uh, uh, you know, the state auditor had to hold them, the city accountable. And they, the newspaper article out of the Pioneer Press was blaming the city council members. And the complaint came from the city manager, Chuck All. Chuck All was the one that gave the Pioneer Press this information. But think about this. We're a Class B city in Maplewood. 
That means there's only one person that runs the city, and that's the city manager. And the city manager is responsible for the counting and the finance and making sure it's done properly. And so Chuck All is calling in the Pioneer Press, blaming the city council on poor financial management. And what the city council should have done is fired Chuck All because he's the only one responsible. The city council is not responsible for what the city manager does. The city manager is. The only thing that the city council can do is fire the manager. They can't fire anybody else. They can't go into the employees and say, get this working together. And then the state auditor looked into everything. Everything was fine. Not a problem with it. And so this uh, smear campaign that's going on in, in Maplewood and calling it the great, well, it's still a dysfunctional city. It was back then, and, it, and it, it, what happened in the Diana Longry term was that the dysfunction in the city was shown, and with Diana there, the city could not bamboozle the well, city council. Okay, the city, the city couldn't bamboozle Diana Longry, and Diana Longry knew how to find out what was going on, and that disturbed the city workers greatly. And so this, this whole campaign piece is, is bad news, it's bad campaigning, and I think uh, this Ask Me or whoever put out that piece of material uh, should be held accountable for producing these lies, and I think Chuck All should be fired. But uh, we have another call, so caller, do you have a comment or question? Uh, yes, hi, Tim. This oh. is Diana Longer, oh, hi, Diana. and I would like to actually add some ex extra additional information. All right, go ahead. Yeah, well, we you see, our our financial records up at the City Hall, they used a software program that was called Crystal Reports. Okay. And Dan Faust, who had been the uh, finance director for over 30 or 33 years. Hmm. He and Gail Bauman, his assistant finance director, they were the only ones, from what I understand, who understood how to run reports using this software program. Okay. And that there was nobody else up at City Hall who actually understood how the program worked. Wow. When Dan, when Dan Faust retired... Uh, Gil Bauman was offered the position of becoming the finance director, and she declined that and said she wanted to go and accept this other job that was closer to her home, and then she left. And she came back once in a while to try to help them to understand how to run these reports. Okay. But as it turns out, it appears that way before I was ever mayor, that these uh, this software that oftentimes actually uh, maybe it checked certain balances, right. but it didn't actually check uh, these kinds of things that the Pioneer Press reported that Chuck All was telling them about. And you see, so this was an ongoing problem. And our right, but finance it, but it's, director it's, that we had when I was mayor, he spent an, an, an extraordinary amount of time trying to figure out how the books were organized, how to run these reports, and he hired people to actually try to uh, de you know, get to the details right. of all this. And in the end, you know, we are not even certain that the, these things that they're claiming were problems back then and before right. I was ever mayor have actually ever been resolved. Well, because, you see, guess who's come back to the city <laughs> of Maplewood to be the uh, finance director? But Miss Gail off. Ballman, yeah. Yeah, who and was Gail in Ballman. charge. Yeah, absolutely. So, but this almost sounds like sabotage because they didn't have anybody trained, and Chuck All was in charge there. And of course, he's now city manager again, and mm -hmm. and so, I mean, what does the city council? They have no authority over uh, the workers there, and and what the city manager right. does as far, as far as the checks and balances, and making sure the system works, and making sure enough people are trained on the system. Right, not... and here's a, an interesting uh, point to bring out as well is that actually at the council we had discussions about 
this problem and about crystal reports and this software. I even uh, brought a book that I had found on crystal reports so that I could try to figure out what was going on. And sitting right to my left, of course, when I was uh, having this discussion was Mr. John Nephew, who was on the council, and he asked me if he could look at that book during the council meeting. Uh He was there. He did nothing to say, my goodness, let's get to the bottom of this, and let's figure out why Crystal Report doesn't work. He just poo-pooed the fact that I had the book there and was trying to figure out why it wasn't working. Well, he probably didn't want you to dig too deep to find out where the <laughs> skeletons lie. All right. Well, thank you very much. we got to move on. And uh, best wishes on your run. I hope you get in as the mayor. Uh, we need you again. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to play a quick video here of um, what took place down at the Minnesota Religious Freedom Forum. And uh, this is one of the attorneys that uh, practice on religious freedom, and let's hear what he has to say. I got the producer hopping around in there. Uh, we're just the down policy there. of New York State was that any community organization or group could come and rent a school building on weekends, pay the standard rent, and it was open to a wide variety of community uses. But if you were a church, you, or you had religious speech, well, we can't have you in there because if you're in there on the weekend paying the same rent, we've somehow established religion. We've made that, you know, the first church of PS 16 or whatever, and we can't have that. And it was very puzzling that, you know, if they allowed Alcoholics Anonymous to meet, nobody thought it converted to the Betty Ford Clinic or things like that. But somehow religious speech was, some, was, was sort of evil. It had to be, you know, uh, insulated. We can't have it. I was, used to wonder, they think like, the religious words would seep into the bricks and then they would pounce on the kids on Monday morning when unsuspecting they returned, you know, back to school. So um, uh, we fought for the, the simple proposition that churches shouldn't be singled out for unequal treatment. That, you know, if they come and they pony up their money the same as anybody else, why shouldn't they be allowed? And the arguments in the Supreme Court were really remarkable because the opposing counsel was saying in response to hypotheticals, well, could you rent the school to a group of atheists? Well, yes, certainly. Could you rent to a group of communists espousing you know, radical overthrow of things? Well, yeah, sure, we can't do that. But what about, you know, what about if you have a debate between an atheist and a minister? Well, no good if you have the minister. Well, how about a debate between a hundred, you know, a, a, an audience of a hundred atheists and just one minister in to present? No, well, you were okay until the minister. This was the sort of paranoia that happened. And the attorney general of the state of New York in the case wrote something like this. He said, it's fine. It it's, should be permissible to exclude churches from these schools because, he reasoned, they do not benefit the community at large. They benefit only a narrow group of adherents who subscribe to their particular philosophy. Well, those words ran into a buzzsaw named Justice Scalia in the Supreme Court. He was magnificent that day. The you know, other lawyer is standing up, and, 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 uh, and he begins by saying, Counselor, I'm from New York. When I lived in New York, we used to grant churches tax-exempt status on the theory that they did good for the culture. Do you still do that in New York? The lawyer begins stammering. And Justice Scalia, never one to be dissuaded by a lawyer attempting to answer a question, presses further. He was in magnificent form. He was like a frenzied white shark and there's blood in the water. You have a, you have a, a stammering attorney and a stupid argument. And boy, this is the stuff he lives for. Furthermore, he said, we used to think that if someone was God-fearing, he might be less likely to mug me or rape my sister. Glad you have it figured out. How's the new regime doing? How's that working out for you? Laughter everywhere in the courtroom. But see, this revealed a worldview. The, the assistant attorney general who wrote those words, you know, afterward told me I was misunderstood. I didn't mean it that way. But you know, I think he kind of did mean something very important, which is that the church is becoming increasingly irrelevant in light of these kinds of trends. And so it's not surprising that we see these attacks on on religious belief, you know, even kind of when people talk about, well, we have a freedom of worship rather than freedom of religion. That's a very subtle linguistic device because what, you know, what do you associate with worship? 
Well, yeah, you can have your religious beliefs as long as you sort of keep them cabined in your four walls over here and don't try to influence public policy with them. Don't try to speak them in public because we find it offensive or something like that. You got a flavor of what was taking place and uh, Joe, uh, I wrote his name down here, in Franco, uh, very fascinating speaker, uh, very knowledgeable about what's going on and anybody in the religious community or freedom community should be very thankful that this man is with uh, the Alliance Defending Freedom and is counseling these attorneys, these thousands of attorneys across the nation defending uh, your right to freedom of religion. Uh, because otherwise there's this, well, there is this huge attack and they'd be winning, but right now Alliance Defending Freedom is winning uh, basically 80% of their cases. Uh, basically all their cases when it gets to the higher court, uh, they lose mostly in, uh, the cases they lose are mostly in the lower court. Um, where it's, who knows what can happen down there. So uh, we'll have a little more on that next week. Um, and I do have a caller. It's probably going to talk about Maplewood. I've told the control room this is the last call on Maplewood because we're going on to other subjects. But caller, do you have a comment or question? I do, Tim. All Thank right. you for at least letting me in on it. Uh, you bet. Uh, Diane Laundry forgot to mention a couple other people <laughs> that were on that council at that very same time. Oh, yeah. Which was Will Rosbeck. Sure. Kathy Juneman. Uh oh Along with Don Nephew. Yeah. Now, between all these people and uh, the ones that were running City Hall at the time, these newspapers got the story that they were delivered. That's right. And uh, no one else got to say anything about it. No research, right. The other right. thing about this AFSCME in, uh, uh, union outfit, they are the biggest liars I've ever seen in my life. These uh, cards that they put out in the mail are giving the most false information I've ever seen. Yeah, I couldn't These, believe it. Telling about people that are on the council, and I can, I can tell you for a fact, that there's one person that has never, ever been on anything for Maplewood. I think she's on a commission right now, and that's the only thing she's ever been on. Right. And that's Margaret Barron's. That's right. She's so never been a council person. Margaret has none of this on her record at all. That's so right. So they, they can't lump her, but they're lumping Wyden her into the... She was part of the council. Yeah. Right. Well, very good, caller. Uh, thank, thank you for you that. Thank you very much. I enjoy you your bet. show. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to get into the main substance of the show. Again, judicial issues, judicial corruption maybe, but there's problems in the judiciary. So let's uh, roll our video there, Nathan. All right, I got him hopping back there. <laughs> talks you're under its spell ah but what do you have when there's nothing left to sell selling out i'd rather call it compromise is easy to do sometimes you have to close your eyes it's not so hard being rich is no disgrace to find a buyer for you who put on your shoes and join the race oh and money talks it has a very soothing voice you're under its spell it's up to you to make the choice ah but what do Before you have you know it, when there's be nothing, nothing left to, to sell, sell. Break the rules People who try are fools When you get older Maybe then you will see I've always found ideals Don't take the place of meals That's how it is And how it will always be It's so nice to have integrity I'll tell you why if you really have integrity, it means your price is very high. So remember when you start to preach and moralize, 
that we all are in the game and brother its name is compromise it's so nice Selling to have him tell you why it's not it's really so happy Remember when you start, 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 start